Christianity in this next section. We're looking at Islam and Christianity in this next section, beginning with Muhammad, the final prophet. I won't deal a whole lot with him at this time, but Muslims believe mankind habitually strayed from the way of Allah that he had revealed through his prophets. In 610 AD in Arabia, Allah sent the last prophet, Muhammad, who would unite the Arab tribes and turn them from idolatry to Islam. The question that's often asked is, is Allah and the God of the Bible the same? 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6 tells us there's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The question that's asked, is Allah and God the same? You hear that statement many times. Oh, we worship the same God. Do we? I want us to look and examine that. Is he just the same God and some people call him Allah? Some people call Buddha. Others call him Jehovah, and Yahweh, or Yahweh, and some would call him Jesus. After all, some people would say, aren't we worshiping the same God? In our day, the God who is called Allah must be compared to the God of the Bible because we need to know if they're one and the same. When Paul wrote those words to Timothy, he said, for there is one God. Now, if we stop right there, we can find that Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and almost every other religion in the world agree. There's one God. And while all of them may agree, this is the heart of Islam, that God is one. But then Paul went on to say to Timothy, one God, one mediator between God and man. And that man's Christ Jesus. And he gave himself as a ransom for men. Now the testimony given in his proper time is what we are seeing here. Islam would debate this part. They would agree in, with us in the first part, there's one God, but not in the last part. They do not agree that Jesus is the one and only mediator between man and God. They believe that Muhammad was a mediator between man and God. Actually, they believe Muhammad received the revelation of God. They would disagree with a part of the verse that says Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus gave himself as a ransom for many. Islam says Jesus did not die on the cross. Allah raptured him to heaven, took him to heaven to protect him from those who would take his life. Islam teaches that Allah protected Jesus, who was a great prophet from the Jews. Now we believe what we believe about Jesus and what we believe the Bible teaches is true when it says he gave himself a ransom for many. That's one of the big differences between Islam and Christianity. There needed to be somebody who could bring God and men together. That person had to be perfect, pure, sinless, holy. For only a pure person could offer his own life as a ransom for others. So Jesus came. So as it were, in a sense, God and man met at Calvary. There at the cross, Jesus destroyed the barrier that separated God and man. That barrier was sin. Jesus made it possible to open the way to God. Now, if Islam teaches that the true God is Allah, and they do, then a couple of things. The true God is the supreme being who created all things. He's the source of all things. That God, according to Islam, is Allah. That's who they state it is. There is a God of the Bible that did all of that, but the God of the Bible sent his son to be the mediator between God and men. Then we have to admit we believe two totally different things here. Islam cannot believe in the God of the Bible and be true to their own religion. If their view is true, then Allah is God, and all other gods are false gods. And indeed, that's what they teach and preach, that every other god is a false god. It's plainly taught in the Quran that there is one true God, and that God is Allah. The Quran emphasizes Allah. There is no God but He, the living, the everlasting. So plainly they teach that Allah is the one true living and everlasting God. 
The Bible, on the other hand, teaches the God of the Bible desires to have a personal relationship and fellowship with man. Islam teaches that Allah is so set apart from man, so high above man, so exalted above man, while he could never concern himself about man's daily problems and man's daily existence and man's little speck of dirt on the place of the earth. Why, he's too exalted for that. He's beyond all of those things. He created all of these things, set them into motion, and he's pretty much left man to make it on his own after that. In Islam, the relationship between God and man is that of master and slave. In Islam, God is the sovereign. Humans must submit. Islam teaches the absolute predestination of both good and evil. So therefore, a follower of Islam can never know if he will have fellowship with Allah. If he does have fellowship with Allah, it won't be in this life. It will be in the life to come. The Christian life, on the other hand, being a Christian, being saved means you have fellowship with God right now. He lives in you through his Holy Spirit. You walk with him. You talk with him. He's a part of you. You're a part of him right now so that when you die, that death only applies to, this, to the body the physical body, the spirit within you that's been walking with God, that's been in fellowship with God through Jesus, just continues on in heaven having fellowship with God. That's why the Bible teaches for the Christian to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. It is a relationship that begins at a point in time, but it continues through all eternity. Allah is completely unknowable. That's not even the purpose of the Muslim religion. Their religion is not to know God. Their religion is to submit to a God they cannot know, they cannot understand. They pray to him as the Quran says. They have said prayers which they say over and over. What if you want to tell him something else? You can't. You've got to go tell him those same things over and over and over. If you travel to a land where there are many Muslims, you're here hear that call to prayer five times every day and you'll see them stop and go to the mosque or stop in their work and bow toward Mecca and pray and recite those prayers. You might say, man, that's dedication. I don't know so much about that. If it's dedication or not, saying the same words over and over and over again. John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true and Jesus, true God and Jesus Christ, to whom you have sent. Does God want to know us? Does he want to know us? Does he want us to know him? Sure he does. Allah is like having the whole world outside of him. And he's in his temple here, and no one can approach the temple. Yet the Bible teaches us God wants to know us, and the only way he knows us is through Jesus Christ. So Allah and God then are different. Now Islam would say that the main thing is not to know God, but to obey God, a God you don't know. It's one thing to obey a father who loves you and who's concerned about your welfare. It's another thing to obey a God that you've never seen, cannot know, but you just follow his commands blindly. The God of Islam declares he doesn't love the sinner for he doesn't love the disobedient. But the gospel of hope is that sinners are loved by God and we're offered the free gift of eternal life in spite of their sin. What do Muslims believe about the Holy Scripture? According to them, there's only one trustworthy Holy Scripture, and that's the Quran. Many prophets before Muhammad were also given Allah's word. Among them are Musa, Dawa, Issa. These are some of the ones that are named. There are others. Most Muslims are taught that Jews and Christians changed and corrupted the previous holy books. Therefore, Allah appointed Muhammad to receive the Quran in order to correct all this corruption. How did Muhammad receive the Quran? Well, in 610 A.D., he sent the angel Gabriel to Muhammad in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Over the next 22 years, Gabriel reveals surahs or chapters to Muhammad with a command to recite them to others. In Islam, they do not allow any interpretation or criticism of the Quran. It's composed of 114 chapters or surahs. 
Each chapter has verses or airs, and I can't pronounce that, I'm sorry. There are 6,616 verses, and Muslims are challenged to memorize all of it. Eighty-six chapters were revealed in Mecca, where the revelation first came to Muhammad. Twenty-eight chapters were revealed in Medina after Muhammad fled from Mecca to Medina. Are there contradictions and inconsistencies between the Quran and the Bible? Many. The Quran says Noah's Ark rested at the top of Mount Judy, Sarah 11:44. The Bible says Mount Ararat. The Quran says Abraham attempted to sacrifice Ishmael, not Isaac, as the Bible teaches. Islam would say the lineage of Muhammad came through Ishmael, <coughs> excuse me, and that Ishmael was the son of promise, not Isaac. Therefore, the sons of Ishmael are the chosen people of God. This would be Arabs, not Jews. The preservation of the Quran is seen that in that shortly after Muhammad's death in 632 AD, his followers gathered the chapters, surahs, into the Quran. The third, Khalif Uthman, had scholars compiled an official Quran and had all the variant texts burned. So the problem you've got here is there's no comparison to the various texts to see if what they compiled is accurate. In Islam, there's practices and rituals. We know that there's five pillars that are talked about. I want to show you the sixth pillar as well that some people buy into and believe. Now, as I go through this, remember that not all buy into the sixth pillar. The five pillars are actual ritual practices, pillars of their religious system. The object is to follow Muhammad's pattern. They want to follow his exact words, motions, and timing found in the Sunnah as they accomplish the pillars. Beliefs are important, but the substance of Islam is the accomplishment of those five pillars. You may believe a lot of things, but do you accomplish this? The first pillar is confession, shahada. It's a public statement said in Arabic that means there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. And making that confession is the first step in becoming a Muslim. Islam requires that everyone say this as a confession. The second pillar, prayer, salat. It's a set ritual to be done five specific times every day, sometimes combined in three sessions. Now I have read where some people pray six times a day, so you get a little bit of a variance there, but most everyone I've read after and talked to say five. Prayers are memorized in Arabic with ritual washings before each sequence. They must cover their head, the body must be pointed in the direction of Mecca. The motions and prostration, prostrations must be followed for the prayers to be valid. If they vary in any of this, it's no longer valid. The third pillar is fasting. Now this is an annual community event for all Muslims except children, pregnant women, and travelers. It lasts the entire lunar month known as Ramadan. During the time of Ramadan, there's abstinence from food, water, sex during the daylight hours. A special meal is served at sunset when the daily fast ends. Everyone is awakened before sunrise to eat and drink to prepare them for the daylight fasting. In Muslims dominated countries, there's often a shift to a schedule with more sleep during the daytime and feasting at night. So, Yes, they have to alter what they do, but they don't really do without a whole lot. Just change when they get involved in some of the meals and sexual relations and that type of thing. Night times can even be festive and social during Ramadan in contrast to a slower daytime. I've read some people say they party most of the night. Uh, I'm not saying that that's fact. I'm just stating what I've heard. Many Muslims gather together for the recitation of the Quran every evening of Ramadan. This would be very devout Muslims, and they would get together and they would recite the Quran. There's also an important three-day holiday following Ramadan. Now that would lead us to the fourth pillar. That's the giving of alms, zakat. It's a, you're expected, required to give 2.5% of a Muslim's wealth, primarily to the poor. There are certain rules for determining the basis of wealth and how you give this. In some countries where the Muslims are 
uh, in control of the government, there's a tax that is placed to collect this. And then there's the fifth pillar. That's the pilgrimage to Mecca. This is to be carried out at least once in a lifetime, providing a Muslim can afford it. Uniformity is enforced in the manner of dressing in a white garment to the shaving of the head for the men. The object is to copy the pattern set by Muhammad and to do all the various rituals he did. And these rituals promise Muslims multiplied credit. Now, get that statement, multiplied credit, as well as help in removing the weight of sins in preparation for judgment. There's no promise or guarantee here that it actually removes them. Keep that in mind. Now, for some people, for those radicals, there is a belief in a sixth pillar, and that's jihad. Some Muslims would include a, a sixth pillar, a holy struggle called jihad. This struggle could be internal, a struggle in the soul to do the right thing, or external, an effort against the enemies of Islam. The interpretation of jihad can determine the difference between moderate and radical Muslims. When you look at the judgment day, belief in the nature of the final judgment day motivates Muslims to faithfully accomplish these pillars. In the Quran, these practices are of great importance. Now back to the jihad, what does that mean? It means holy war. It's presented in the Quran as a declaration of war against all non-Muslims. It's an effort to bring all the world into the Muslim faith by whatever means are necessary. So in the early days of Islam, Muhammad the prophet, its founder, had two ways that he brought people into the Islam religion. One, he converted them. He preached to people his doctrine, his truth, and he converted people. Two, he conquered them through war. I want us to move now to the perspective that the Islam people have toward women. Muslim women generally consider themselves protected and satisfied within their own culture. Their fulfilling social life is usually gender separated and happens primarily within extended families and among some close neighbors. There is a so-called protection of Muslim women. Muslims teach that women are valued. In fact, Mohammed brought an end to the practice of female infanticide, widely practiced before his time. The honor of women is a major concern in Muslim societies. The reputation of the family is linked with the women. Now, there seems to be, to me, some contradiction in all of this. Islam maintains roles and expectations that predate Muhammad when it comes to women. The modest dress code is to protect women. If seen without loose clothing or a veil, men might judge a woman based on her appearance or may try to abuse her. Now, this is one of the things that uh, Muslims dislike about America and the values of America. Muslim women next on our PowerPoint do not need to wear a veil or loose clothes at home or when only women are present. But I'm not quite sure how any religion or any sect or any group of people can talk about lifting women high when they practice polygamy. And since marriage and childbearing are highly valued in the Middle East, polygamy is allowed and yet controlled. Islam limits a man to four wives and requires equal treatment for each. Let me move on to Sharia law because that involves the woman sometime. And maybe that'll help you better understand some of the things that, that take place when it comes to the women and how they're treated and how they're looked upon. Sharia law also spelled a couple of different ways, and I've included that. It's cast from the actions and words of Muhammad, which are called Sunnah, and the Quran, which he authored. The Sharia law itself cannot be altered, but the interpretation of Sharia law called Fai by Imans is given some leadway. As a legal system, the Sharia law covers a wide range of topics. While other legal codes deal primarily with public behavior, Sharia law covers public behavior, private behavior, and private beliefs. So it even covers what you believe privately. Of all legal systems in the world today, Islam Sharia law is the most intrusive and strict, especially against women. Now notice some of the things according to Sharia law, and this is not all, it's just some. 
Theft is punishable by imputation of the right hand. Criticizing or denying any part of the Quran is punishable by death. Criticizing or denying Muhammad is a prophet is punishable by death. Criticizing or denying Allah is punishable by death. A Muslim who becomes a non-Muslim may be punished by death. A non-Muslim who leads a Muslim away from Islam is punishable by death. A non-Muslim man who marries a Muslim woman is punishable by death. A man can marry an infant girl and consummate the marriage when she is nine years old. Now, that moves into being a pedophile, not taking care of ladies. I left one out because of the language about women and how that uh, some of the surgeries they perform on women. A woman can have one husband, but a man can have up to four wives. Doesn't seem quite fair to me. Mohammed can have more. A man can unilaterally divorce his wife, but a woman needs her husband's consent to divorce. A man can beat his wife for insubordination. Testimonies of four male witnesses are required to prove rape against a woman, and we all know that's not likely to take place. A woman who has been raped cannot testify in court against a rapist. A woman's testimony in court, allowed only in property cases, carries half the weight of a man's. A female inherits half of what a male heir inherits. A woman cannot drive a car as it leads to upheaval. A woman cannot speak alone to a man who is not her husband or relative. Meat to be eaten must come from animals that have been sacrificed to Allah. Muslims engage in a tie, and i sorry, I just cannot pronounce that, but it goes on to talk about they can lie to non-Muslims to advance Islam. So they can engage in whatever is necessary to advance Islam, and that list goes on. Now, I wonder if you've thought about the countries that have Sharia law practiced. Muslims aspire Sharia state is Saudi Arabia the birthplace of Muhammad that has no legal code other than the Sharia and enforces it without mercy. But as detailed here with the Sharia law is also used in full or in part nationally or regionally in some of the other places. There are places in the United States, not legally, but there are places in the United States that people will practice Sharia law. Now, I'm not saying they do this with the approval of our government, but we do know that our government doesn't do a whole lot of condemning of it. You've got the United Kingdom, you've got Canada. Uh, United Kingdom has become largely uh, Muslim. So these are just a few of the nations that kind of shocked me when I discovered this in some of my studies. Muslims claim that Jesus was one of God's prophets, not God's only begotten son. You'll hear a great deal from Muslims about how they believe, believe in Jesus, how they honor Jesus, how they reverence Jesus, how they believe that he was miraculously born, how they even honor Mary, the mother of Jesus. They believe in the miracles of Jesus, but don't let that fool you. When you examine and get down to the real belief, they fall short of believing on the biblical Jesus. Because while claiming to reverence him, they actually deny that he was God's only begotten son. Now that goes back to one of the differences in Allah and the God of the Bible. Because Allah is only one person. The God of the Bible is one God that manifests himself in three persons. In John chapter 14 verses 6 through 10, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me? Philip, he has seen me, has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Now the Quran would deny that Jesus ever claimed to be God. That Jesus ever claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. We all know the Bible says otherwise. Many false religions are guised in the praise of Jesus and praise for his teaching. But in the Quran, the story of Jesus is there. Their version of the story of Jesus 
Make no mistake about it. They do not believe that Jesus is God. And the Quran is very clear at that point. Muslims adamantly reject the idea that Jesus is the Son of God. For in the Quran we read this. They say God has taken to him a son. Yet they say God has not taken to him a son. So you got a contradiction. Now Muslims would say, well, Jesus was miraculously born. He had no human father. Now that sounds like they believe in the virgin birth. No, that's not what they mean. The virgin birth is that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mer Mary so that the thing conceived in her was God, God's own son, God's own essence was conceived in the womb of a virgin. And so she brought forth a son who would be the savior of the world. To them that would utter blasphemy against Allah when you begin talking like that. For the Quran says praise belongs to God, Allah, who has not taken to him a son. Again, you've got a contradiction here between what some say is in the Quran, what some say is not in the Quran. And it, it's kind of like in church growing up, I remember hearing preachers used to say things that they would lead you to believe they were in the Bible, but come to find out as I got older, they weren't in the Bible at all. Again, we need to warn those who say God has taken to himself a son. A monstrous word it is, issuing out of their mouths. They say nothing but Muslims deny that Christ was God incarnate. That is, God in human flesh. In Sarah 43:59, the Quran says, Jesus was no more mortal, no more than a mortal, whom Allah favored and made an example to the Israelites. The claim of the Quran in Quran 1:12 is this, Jesus is a created being. That God created Jesus just as he created Adam. Now here is what they would say about the birth of Jesus, that Jesus was God's son in the same sense that Adam was God's son. So what it tells us is the Muslims deny that Jesus died on the cross also. For in the Quran 4, 156-158, that they said and boast, We killed Jesus, Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him. Nay, Allah raised him up unto himself. Now, if they don't believe Jesus died on the cross, why don't they believe that? Well, it would be unthinkable in their mind that Allah would put a highly favored prophet in the hands of Jews to be crucified on the cross. What they say and believe is that the Jews just said they killed Jesus, and the Jews lied according to the Muslims. They want everybody to think they killed Jesus because he was saying that he was the king of the Jews and they rejected him. So Muslims present the idea that the Jewish people are just saying they killed Jesus. Didn't really happen. Jesus didn't really die on the cross. Allah received him up to himself. He just raptured him up just as Muhammad was raptured or taken up to heaven to sit at Allah's right hand. There are many traditions about what happened to Jesus and Muslim thought. This is just one of several and I've shared a few passages from the Quran with you. Look at what the Muslims teach about him. Of course, they would come back and say the Bible we have is corrupted, which we know to be absolutely false. Islam denies his divine nature. Let me back up a moment. There are some copies of translations of the Bible, perhaps, that are corrupted, but we know that what they're presenting here has nothing to do with particular translations. It has to do with all translations. So let me pick back up. Islam denies his divine nature when it defines Jesus as mere man. No mere man could say, come here and look at me. When you look at me, you're looking at God. We have places we would put a man today if he said that. Islam denies his mission when it teaches he never died on the cross. And of course, he never rose from the dead then if he didn't die. Look at what Jesus said in John 8, 24. You know, there are so many people who say, well, brother, we're all trying to get to the same place. The Muslims, the Christians, the Jews, the Zens, the Buddhists, we're all trying to get to the same place. They may all be trying to get to the same place, but we've all got to go one way. That's the way of the cross. It's through Jesus. Look at what Jesus said in John 8, 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So it's incumbent on us to preach the cross, to uphold the cross, to lift high the cross, to magnify the cross, and to magnify our Savior Jesus. 
and to tell all people about him and his wonderful love. He came to earth, lived, gave up glory of heaven, came to a world of woe, was scoffed, rejected, crucified, and on the third day arose, ascended back to the Father, and one day will return for those who know him. I hope this will give you a little bit of an idea of some of the things in the Muslim faith we do not have enough time to dig in depth with this. Walter Martin has some information, and I'm giving you a, an assignment to look up some of these things. But uh, I encourage you, if you want to read more about Muslims, to do so. And, and just uh, be cautious and be careful not to overreact to any. But this is a dangerous organization, a very powerful organization. And they're so radical in the sense that they are willing to die for their beliefs. God help us to love Jesus that much. That would be my prayer for each of you today, and most of all for myself as well.